Uh, welcome to Harvard Law School Private Equity Roundtable organized by Harvard Association for Law and Business. Uh, my name is Vladimir Bosiljevac and I teach uh, courses on private equity here at the law school. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce David Rubenstein, the keynote speaker for today's roundtable, moderated by Heather Lee, uh, who is a co-president of HALB. Uh, David Rubenstein is, as you know, co-founder and co-executive chairman of the Carlyle Group, one of the world's largest and mo most successful investment firms with over $210 billion in assets under management. And before co-founding Carlyle in 1987, Mr. Rubenstein uh, practiced law and work, served at White House for 14 years. Besides his tremendous success in his business career, He's equally known for his philanthropy. Uh, Mr. Rubenstein is chairman uh, of the boards of trustees of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the Smithsonian Institution, and the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, trustee of the National Gallery of Art, the University of Chicago, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, John Hopkins Medicine, Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts, the Institute for Advanced Study, the Brookings Institution, the World Economic Forum, and president of the Economic Club of Washington. Among many other philanthropic initiatives and awards, Mr. Rubenstein is an original signer of the Giving Pledge and a recipient of Carnegie Medal of Philanthropy and the Museum of Modern Art David Rockefeller Award. Mr. Rubenstein here at Harvard also gives through his positions as a fellow of the Harvard Corporation as chairman of Harvard Global Advisory Council and as a member of the Board of Dean's Advisors at HBS. Uh, Mr. Rubenstein is 1970 magna cum laude graduate of Duke University and uh, 1973 graduate of the University of Chicago Law School where he was also an editor of the Law Review. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Sir, and thank you, Mr. Rubenstein, for taking the time to be My with us My pleasure today. to be here. So I'd like to begin with how you grew up, the stories that molded you as a youth that brought you to where you are today. Right. So you grew up in a blue-collar neighborhood in Baltimore. That's correct. Your father was a poster worker. That's correct. Your mom worked in a dress shop. That's right. What were some of the stories from your youth that led you to become the self-made man that you are today? Well, um that be complicated. I'd have to be on a psychiatric couch to answer that appropriately, probably. But um, I, uh, one of the great uh, advantages in my life is that I grew up with no money. If you grow up with a great deal of money, as my children have, it's harder to be as highly motivated as you grow as when you grow up in a modest family. So my father made about seven thousand dollars a year in the post office. I was their only child. My, neither my, my parents graduated from college or high school, so you have a sense that if you're gonna get somewhere in the world, you have to do it on your own. And the result is you tend to work harder and maybe you absorb learning more readily because you know you need to uh, do well in school. So it's a big advantage. And I think the greatest thing that parents can give their children is unconditional love. So my parents supported me. They couldn't open doors for me. They couldn't get me jobs. They couldn't get me into schools. They couldn't do anything that would be the kind of thing that wealthy parents might today, leaving athletic teams aside, get you, um, into school with or help you with. But in the end, it was a great advantage. So I uh, got lucky and um, did okay in school, but I wasn't a superstar. And some of you may be superstars. Uh, there are people, some of you may be in this audience who are these kind of people who you're first in your class in high school, uh, all American athlete, uh, first in your class in college, Rhodes Scholar, president of the Harvard Law Review, Supreme Court clerk, White House fellow, everything that you could possibly want. My experience is that, with some exceptions, those people don't actually do as well later in life because they often coast. So I divide life into three parts. The first third is when you can be a Rhodes Scholar, president of the Harvard Law Review, first in your class at Harvard Law School, or the equivalent somewhere else. And the second third of life is when you're really getting your career underway, you kind of decide what you're really going to do. And the third third is where you're really, I won't say coasting, but you're reaping the benefits of what you have done in the second third. In the first third, if you are all those wonderful things I described, you might tend to just coast the rest of your life and not accomplish as much. So when I worked in the White House for President Carter, there was a person um, who went to Harvard College. He was in the administration. Harvard College, summa cum laude, 
president of the Harvard Crimson, Rhodes Scholar, PhD from Berkeley in economics, Yale Law School, editor-in-chief of Yale Law Journal, Supreme Court clerk. And when people saw this resume, they said, well, no point even interviewing the guy. Plus, he was, you know, uh, blonde hair, blue-eyed, great athlete, everything you'd want. I mean, say, this is perfect. Um, and every time he would get a job, people would say, you're too good for this job. We'll give you another job. And he got all these jobs after just one year at each thing. The result is when he got to be 45, he had not actually accomplished anything because he was just getting jobs based on his resume from when he was 20 or so. So the advantage of not having that kind of resume was I knew I had to work harder. And so the advantage of coming from a more modest background is you're more likely, I think, to accomplish things. And if you look at the people that have won Nobel Prizes as an indicator, they are almost always people who came from lower income families. Very rarely did somebody come from a billionaire family and they won a Nobel Prize. I, I haven't seen that happen yet. So even though you said you are not an academic superstar in high school, you still won a scholarship to Duke University. It was wasn't a basketball a, scholarship, I assure you. It was, was uh, I was, uh, I am a Zionist now. Um, I love Zion Williamson, but um, I was not a great athlete either. In fact, I was the only person in Duke's history got cut from an intramural basketball team. And there were only four other people on the team, so it's hard to do that. Um, but I did get a scholarship, but it wasn't, you know, it was, you know, I still had to, to work through college, and um, I still needed to have summer jobs. So I got enough to get, get through it, but it wasn't spectacular. I see. You also went to University of Chicago Law School. Well, I had intended to come to this law school, and um, but what happened was I applied to a lot of law schools, and I said whoever gave me the biggest scholarship, that's where I was going. So I, uh, you know, I was thinking I was coming here, and all of a sudden, um, University of Chicago said they had a program to give a full scholarship to certain students. I hadn't even heard of it. I'd never even been to Chicago, the city or the, the university. So I said, okay, a full scholarship is great. And they said, send in your $50 and you reserve your place for your full scholarship, you come next year. Then they sent me another letter saying, send in your $50 and you reserve your place in a law school dorm if you want to live in a law school dorm. So I said, well, $50 was a lot of money to me then. So I said, well, using the course and logic that I had taken at Duke, if I send in the $50 to the law school dorm people, surely they'll tell the law school people I'm coming to get the scholarship. Why would I need a law school dorm if I'm not going to be in the law school? Well, that logic didn't really work. And so the first day I showed up at law school, I said, here I am, David Rubenstein, full scholarship recipient. They said, well, you didn't send your $50. We gave that to somebody else. I said, well, I sent in the $50 to the law school dorm. Why would I need a law school dorm? I'm not coming here. They said, that's a completely separate department. We don't even know those people. And so I started to cry, saying my legal career is over. I thought I'd be on the Supreme Court. I, all these great things I was going to do. And finally, they didn't want anybody crying in the admissions office, I guess. So um, they said, OK, we, we'll give you the scholarship. So. I was very grateful for them. I've now given them uh, $45 million in scholarship money to make up for uh, their gift. So, uh, and uh, I, some of you, maybe you, some of you have been offered this. I have a program where I, I bribe people to go to the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, the best people every 20, I get 20 a year. So we have 60 people who are on full scholarships at, at University of Chicago. And it's designed to bribe people to maybe go there over some other law schools. Maybe any, any of you ever? Got been bribed there or tempted, but anyway, they have a lot of people who are tempted to go, and it, you know, bribery usually works, so they get some pretty good students who otherwise would probably go to Harvard. And after you graduated from Chicago Law School, you went to work at the White House as the assistant to the president. I did work president. in the White House. At the White House, you were known for your Herculean work ethics. You were first to come, last to leave. What drove you to be such a workaholic? Well, I, went, I got, um, if you want to work in the White House, and I did, I had no interest in making money. I grew up in a poor family. I was interested only in giving back to society. John Kennedy gave this great speech when I was uh, in sixth grade. He said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And I wanted to help my country. I thought I could go into government politics. That would you know, be what I could do. There were no hedge funds, private equity funds, tech startups in those days. If you wanted to practice law, you practice law. If you wanted to be a, uh, in business, you went to your family's company, or maybe you went to a large company like IBM. But there were no entrepreneurial kind of startups. So business wasn't quite as ex exciting. And I was only interested in helping my country. I had no interest in money at all. So I, uh, I went to work at, at Paul Weiss after law school for a man named Ted Sorensen, who had written this great speech for John Kennedy that I just referred to, the great inaugural address. I thought some of his luster would rub off on me. And it didn't, really. Um, after a couple years of practicing at Paul Weiss, they said, well, you know, you're not that good a lawyer and maybe you should think of something else. And my client said to me, you know, you're really not cut out for this, so maybe you should do something else. So I got the hint that I should leave Paul Weiss, and I was hoping that Ted Sorensen would get me a job, and he got me a job ultimately with a man who he said was running for president, had a good chance. Um, and I said, who is it? Jimmy Carter. I said, He's, isn't he the peanut farmer in Georgia? He's no chance of being president of the United States. 
but I, got, I had nothing else to do, so I went to work for him. Um, and uh, I joined Jimmy Carter when he was uh, 33 points ahead of Gerald Ford in 1976 in the general election. And when I was finished with Carter, Carter won by one point. So Carter said, like, what was your contribution? I was way ahead before you showed up, and now I barely won. <laughs> Um, so I did that. I managed to get inflation to 19%, which is the highest we've had in, you know, 50 years. <laughs> so nobody, uh, you know, thought that, uh, you know, that I've done a good job. But I said, we can't possibly lose the election because we're running against an old, old man who's such a fossil, he can barely get out of the bed in the morning. He's 69 years old. Ronald Reagan, how could we lose to this old man? Uh, I was then 31. I'm now 69. So I'm the same age as Ronald Reagan was, and now it doesn't look quite as bad, but Reagan beat us. And some of you will have the same experience that I had. The people tell you how great you are. When I was in the White House, everybody wanted to lobby me. I had a lot of influence with the president. I'm going on Air Force One, Marine One, and Camp David. And people come and tell you how brilliant you are, how great you are, because they want something from you. And they always said, and by the way, if you ever want to leave, call me up. And I said, well, I don't want to leave. I'm going to be in the second term of Carter. I'll be the senior domestic policy advisor, and I'll be very influential then. Really great. They said, well, okay, but if you change your mind, call me. Well, the day after we lost the election, I started calling all these people, and they didn't call back. And some of you may have this experience as well, where people tell you how great you are and because they want something from you, but when you don't have what they, they want, then they don't give you anything. So I couldn't get them to call me back. I went back and practiced law again. And some of you will probably have this experience. You'll realize, despite your years of law school, if you're in law school here, um, you're not cut out for it. You don't like it as much as you thought. So I went back and practiced law after the White House. I'll, it was hard to get a job because nobody wanted a Carter White House aide. Finally, somebody felt sorry for me. They gave me a job. But I realized I was not very good at it. And you can't, um, you can't accomplish anything great if you don't like it because you'll never manage the skills. So nobody, again, ever won a Nobel Prize by hating what they do or by doing it nine to five, five days a week. You have to love what you want to do and work around the clock really to accomplish something. And I just didn't do that in the practice of law. So I, I started my firm in 1987 and it became a large private equity firm. It enabled me to do a lot of the other things I've now done. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Okay. The founding of the Carlyle Group okay. in 1987. The industry was still very nascent at that time. Why did you choose to join the buyout industry? Why not venture or real estate? Well, I was practicing law, not that successfully. Again, once again, my clients said, well, you're not that great a lawyer. Are you sure you really want to do this? And my partner said, well, you know, you're not that great a lawyer. Why don't you try something else? So I was looking about something else to think about doing. And I, nobody wanted me to go back in government because Ronald Reagan was in, in you know, government and you know, he didn't want a Carter White House aide. So um, I read two things that changed my life. And you will all have this experience. Probably you read something that, you, that registers in your brain that changes your life. The two things were this. One, a man named Bill Simon, who had been Secretary of the Treasury in the Ford administration, left the Ford administration after Carter became president, and he went out and did something called a leveraged buyout. And he bought a company called Gibson Greeting Cards, and he put in roughly a million dollars of his own money and made roughly $80 million in about two and a half years. So I read about it in the early 80s. I said, wait a second. This guy made $80 million on two or three years of investment. He only put a million of his own money in. That's a better than practicing law. But I didn't know exactly what a leveraged buyout was, so I went down the street to Bill Miller, who had been Secretary of the Treasury in the Carter years, and said, your predecessor did a leverage buyout. Maybe you could do one and I can do your legal work for you as you're building this company. And he said, well, are you really that good a lawyer? I said, well, I'm a great lawyer. Of course, everybody knows that. But of course, he probably knew I wasn't a great lawyer. He ultimately decided not to do it. So I was thinking maybe I should start a leverage buyout firm in Washington by myself, but I had no finance experience. So I finally, I recruited some people that had some finance experience in Washington. And I was hurrying to do it because of this reason. I, the second thing I read was this. I read that an entrepreneur will start his or her first company between the ages of 28 and 37 on average. It's always a Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg. But on average, an entrepreneur starts his or her first company between 28 and 37. And after 37, it's like a woman's biological time clock. You are, your chance of reproducing goes down after a certain age, and your chance of becoming an entrepreneur goes down after a certain age. Well, I read that when I was 37. So I said, uh-oh, if I don't do it now, I may never start a company. I'll be doomed to practice law the rest of my life. So I decided to do it. I recruited three people who had finance experience in Washington. And I did it in Washington on, because that's where I live. And I had a theory. Uh, Everett Dirksen, who was a former Senate minority leader in the 1960s, said, if you're getting out of town, get out in front and pretend you're leading a parade. Now, what does that mean? It means take advantage of the situation you find yourself in. You're getting kicked out of town, pretend you're leading a parade. So I'm saying, I'm in Washington, D.C. We understand companies more heavily affected by the federal government than those guys in New York. 
Now, that might have been true, it might not have been true, but it sounded good. So we were able to raise a little money around the idea that we would do investments in companies heavily affected by the government, and, and the deals tended to work out, so we built the business. Let me ask you about a deal that brought you okay. and the Carlyle Group to national attention. That was the $130 million purchase of the BDM International from Laurel in 1990. Right. Okay. What was it about that made it a deal that defined Carlyle Group three years okay. after its foundation? Well, we were doing a few deals from time to time, and they were okay, nothing spectacular. And then an opportunity came along to buy a, um, what is called in Washington, a Beltway Bandit. Now, for all of you who don't know what that is, that's a, kind of a company that services the, the Pentagon or, or services the federal government, but it like, does a consulting firm. It does some uh, work for the federal government that the government doesn't want to do itself. So one of the larger ones in the defense industry was something called BDM. It stood for the founders. Uh, the last names were B, D, and M. And it was a you know, good-sized company, and it had been acquired, in effect, by Ford Aerospace, and Ford Aerospace wanted to sell it for lots of reasons. So we tried to buy it, and we had, I brought in the firm a former Secretary of Defense, Frank Carlucci, who had been Secretary of Defense under Ronald Reagan, so he had a lot of credibility in this area. We bought it, we made six times our money, and it gave us some credibility. And from that, we could go out and raise funds and, and build a, a real business. So it, it worked out. And a lot of times at that period of your founding of the group, a lot of people identified you as a buyout defense firm right. with deep sourcing connections in the government, D.C. Right. Was that a fair characterization? Well, um, there's an old saying that generals like to fight the last war. Some of you must have heard this. So I had brought in Frank Carlucci when we only had about six people in the firm. I brought in a former Secretary of Defense. I didn't really know him. He was in the Carter administration as a deputy CIA director, but I had never been involved with the CIA when I was in the Carter, so I didn't really know him. Uh, he was looking to come on corporate boards, but he, he wasn't a lawyer, didn't want to be in a part of a law firm, so he kind of was looking for a perch to hang out on, and we, he said he could work with us. He'd go on a lot of corporate boards. But he was able to call people as a former Secretary of Defense and get people on the phone. So four years later, when George Herbert Walker Bush lost the presidential election of Bill Clinton, I said, well, the same technique might work with people who are in the Bush administration. Let me go after the ultimate gold standard of people leaving the government, Jim Baker, former, sec former Secretary of State, former Secretary of Treasury, former Chief of Staff to Ronald Reagan. So I didn't know Baker, but somebody introduced me. I found that yet for a few months I convinced him to come. He said, can I bring my deputy, Dick Darman? Okay. And then he said later, can I bring my friend, George Herbert Walker Bush, former president? I said, okay. And then George Herbert Walker Bush said, can I bring my friend, John Major? I said, okay. So we had a former prime minister, former president of the United States, former secretary of defense, former secretary of state, former head of OMB, and people said, hey, this is a government exile. And it worked wonderfully in one, for a while because people would want to see us. Uh, if you go to Kuwait to raise money and you take George Herbert Walker Bush with you, not that difficult to raise money in Kuwait with George Herbert Walker Bush. Um, or you go to Saudi Arabia with Jim Baker, not that hard. If your last name is Rubenstein, you probably wouldn't raise that much money normally, but you have Jim Baker with you, you'll probably be okay. When George W. Bush got elected, his father said, I can't be in business anymore, so I'm going to retire. Fine. But then after a couple months, he got tired of being retired. He came back and said, I can still do some things with you. But then when the, when the Iraq war went forward, we were blamed for it because we were seen as a government in exile. We were like the Bush administration, so we had all these former government people with us. So we, it, it kind of, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. It was very helpful in a while in giving us credibility, but then when the war in Iraq got blamed on us, it was harmful. So I had to retire all these people one week, and then I brought in Lou Gerstner, the former chairman of IBM and CEO of IBM, to be our chairman. So that was a technique that worked, but sometimes you know, it didn't work perfectly towards the end. Let me ask you about fundraising. Yes. So you have told people that you subscribe to Woody Allen's maxim that 80% of success comes from simply by showing up. Right. Um, you travel nonstop around the world to meet with investors, often going to places like the Middle East where right, no right. key measure happened before. Were you a natural fundraiser or did you have to pick up well, some skills along the way? When I started the firm, uh, you know, I thought buyouts mean you, you analyze a company, you do your due diligence, then you arrange the financing, then you do the oversight of the company, then you figure out how to exit it. And that's the basic business. You, um, it's different than it was 30 years ago. It's more, more intensive uh, oversight of the companies. And, and more value added, but essentially look for companies, negotiate the deal if you can get it, finance the companies, oversee it, figure out how to exit and how to add value. Okay, but to do all that, you have to have money. So where does the money come from? It doesn't come from trees. So you, you, know, you can borrow money from banks for a leverage buyout, but you gotta get to have the equity. So where does the equity come from? Well, somebody has to go out and ask for it. 
So my partners all had MBAs and they were finance people. But I didn't have an MBA and I didn't really understand finance that well at that time. So I said, okay, I'll do the job of going out and asking people for money. Now, I'd always associated fundraising with, you know, kind of back slapping, you know, beer drinking, uh, uh, suspender wearing uh, kind of guys with slick back hair and, you know, playing golf on the weekends and all that, none of which I did. So I didn't, wasn't sure I would be good at it because I was more mild mannered and just kind of knew my brief. But I, I basically started with a concentric circle of friends, relatives, former friends, kind of acquaintances, and worked my way around the world. And I was willing to do it um, because the others didn't want to do it, it was necessary. And I kind of invented something that hadn't happened before. Historically, private equity firms were mom and pop operations. When KKR did the famous RJR deal in 1989, 1989, they only had seven people in the firm. Why? Because the partnership agreements all said you can only have one fund at a time because all the people in the firm have to spend 100% of their time managing that fund, which makes sense. If you give money to people, you want them to spend your, their, their time managing this fund. I decided, as most entrepreneurs do, they try to break the rules. And by definition, if you're an entrepreneur, you're doing something nobody else did before, and you're probably breaking rules. The rule that I broke was this. I said to my partners after I spent a few years finally helping them raise a $100 million fund, which is all I could raise, $100 million. I said, uh, tell you what, you guys manage this buyout fund. I have an idea. I'm gonna create a Fidelity or a Vanguard or a T. Rowe Price of private equity the way those people had done it in the mutual fund business, which is to say, have multiple funds, and you can say to people, you wanna be in a buyout fund, we have that. You wanna be in a growth capital fund, we have that. You wanna be in a venture fund, we have that. You wanna be in a real estate fund, we have that. You wanna be in a distressed debt fund, we have that. And take advantage of our brand name, centralized fundraising, legal tax accounting, other administrative things in, in Washington, and then have these dedicated funds, all of which we would control the investment uh, and oversight of. So people laughed at me and people said I was a franchisor, I was like McDonald's selling out you know, fran franchises everywhere. But the truth is I was creating these funds. It was a model that hadn't happened before. Others have, I think, done it probably better than we have now, but that was the model. And so to do that, I had a lot of funds and to do that, I had to go out and raise money for these funds uh, you know, perpetually. So I, I did it myself for a while, but then ultimately I built a gigantic fundraising operation because we were always in the market for something. The sun never set on a Carlisle fundraising effort. We we're always raising money. And so I got to know people all over the world. I was on the road for, you know, six days a week all over the world. So going everywhere, I knew, I knew more people in Abu Dhabi than I think I knew in my hometown of Baltimore. I was running around the world. So ultimately, I built a network of people. Now we have at Carlisle about 125 people in the fundraising effort. So, uh, but that's what I did. I did, I did it. And the Woody Allen line you referred to was a, a line that Woody Allen famously came up with years ago, either, I can't remember, it's 80%, 85% or 90% of life just showing up. So what that really means is, you know, um, if I want to raise money in Abu Dhabi, it's still, it's still this way. If I, I've been to Abu Dhabi 10 times in the last three years, and I know everybody in the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority or the Kuwait Investment Authority or any equivalent group, um, if I say to them, we have a new fund, you know all our people from the previous fund, you like the previous fund, um, I'll just do this by telephone and tell you the new fund, read the documents, and tell us you want, how much you want to put in. Or maybe we'll do it by video. No, no, you gotta show up, show me that you love me, show me that you really care, so fly to Abu Dhabi and do the meeting in person. So, you know, I don't know whether it's really necessary to do it in many ways, you can get the same information by not showing up, but they, people like you to show up, and it's like Woody Allen's phrase, if showing up is, you know, 80% of the, of, the, of the effort, because it doesn't really add that much, but it gives you a, a personal sense that you really care. Then other than by, by just showing up, how do you convince people to give you their money for you to keep for potentially 10 years or more? Well, it's obviously not by charm and good looks, right? It, it's obviously something else. Um, people give you their money because they trust you, they believe what you say, they think that they're going to give, they're going to get their money back and a profit. And I think that you develop trust over a period of time, so people will say, well, you've made money from before, you might make it again. My theory on having multiple funds was this. If you were in my buyout fund and you made money with me, if I come to you and say I have a venture capital fund, you should say logically, you know nothing about venture capital, so I'm not gonna give you money, I'll give it to people that only do venture capital. But you say, well, you're honest, I like you, you guys treat me well, I'll give you a chance, and that was basically the leap of faith that people were willing to make. And I would say, in terms of fundraising, Nobody here in this audience has gone to Harvard Law School or wherever you're, you're in school 
and told, told your parents, you know what I want to do when I grow up? I want to be a fundraiser. Nobody says, I want to be a fundraiser. They want to be a lawyer, a judge, or, or a business person, or a private equity person. Nobody says, I've grown up to be a fundraiser. And why is that? Because people think that asking people for money is a little dirty, difficult, it's unseemly. I don't quite look at it that way. I maybe did years ago, but I basically say, if you're selling something, you should be proud of it. If you have something to sell that's good, what, why is it harmful to say to somebody, why don't you give me money and I'll invest it on your behalf and you'll get money back and a profit. Now, in life, you all will find that um, when you're out of school, um, if I were to ask the question of this audience when they're out of school, uh, about 90% of their people will, will raise their hand when I ask these questions. One, what percentage of you have asked people for money in the last month for a, fund, for a business, philanthropic, or political activity? Um, and the answer will be probably half people will ask people for political contributions or for somebody, or, uh, for, for a business venture, or for a philanthropic activity. And what percentage of you um, have actually been asked for these kind of investments. You'll find that life is all about fundraising to some extent. We've become a perpetual fundraising machine in the Western world. People are always asking people for money. So I've gotten used to it and I get asked for lots of money for charitable contributions. I ask people for charitable contributions and you know people can say yes or no, but you know that's how the world really works. So it's not that difficult to ask people for money. Uh, I think if you have something to sell, you think it's good. In the investment world, if you have a track record that's good, people will keep giving you money until you don't have a track record that's good. And also helping, if you treat the investors well, you give them information, you treat them appropriately, if your record is not the best, they will probably give you some credence. And, but if your rec record is really, really good, you don't have to treat people quite as well. People will beg to give you money. Let me ask you about cyclicality. So you said about private equity back in 2006. Um, this has been a golden age for our industry, but nothing continues to be golden forever. Right. So here we are 13 years later. Some people are saying that the music is slowing down. Is this a time to harvest or are you and your team still out there buying more? Well, um, in like 2006, private equity, when, let me start back. The earth itself is about four and a half billion years old. Life on this earth started about three billion years ago. Um, humans and our predecessors started maybe three million years ago, Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal. Homo sapiens, which all of us are, are about 400,000 years old. So just say, think about this, of the 400,000 years that we've been on the face of Earth and our ancestors, 400,000 years, for 99.9% .9 of that time, there was no private equity, uh, amazingly. And for 99.9% .9 of those 400,000 years, people didn't worry about having money invested on their behalf. If you were living in caves or you're barely, you know, you're just subsistence, you're just trying to stay alive. When people were living in caves 400,000 years ago, the average life expectancy was 20. In fact, the life expectancy in the United States at 1900 was 49. So people were worried about three things, subsistence, um, you know, shelter, and basically continuing the species, which is what all species really worry about how to stay alive, how to keep the species alive, and how to stay alive by either sheltering themselves or, or having food. So for 99.9% .9 of the time that humans have been on the face of the earth, they didn't worry about investing money to get good returns. Probably in the Western world, I can't speak as well about the Eastern world, but in the Western world, probably around the 1600s, 1700s, a new concept arose. Some people could worry about things more than subsistence. They had a little extra money, and they didn't know what to do with it. So what did they do? They said, I'll give it to somebody else, and that person can give me more money back than I gave them. We'll call it investing. And so the first kind of investing was you gave people some money, they were banks, and they would give you back a fixed income amount. So you might charge, the bank might charge you a 1% fee to make it simple, and they would give you back 2% interest. And that was what a lot of money investing was around uh, 1600s, 1700s. Then equity got invented, and you could give people money, and you might get an equity return, a higher risk, higher reward, and then stock exchanges came along, and then people ultimately did two things with their money when they invested it. They would uh, basically give it to somebody for a fixed income return, maybe one or two percent per annum, or uh, equity return, three or four or five percent per annum. And then that's all there really was. And then private equity came along, and it came along you know, you could say Christopher Columbus invented it because when he came over, uh, he got Queen Isabella to give him a 
carried interest in the gold and the and the uh, profits he realized, but there were, was no gold and, profit and, and ca profits in the end, so there was, he never got a carried interest. But to be serious, after World War II, some people came up with the idea of starting a new industry. They called it adventure capital. They're, they were people who came out of the technology part of the military. They wanted to start new companies. They called it adventure capital. And they asked people for three things that nobody had ever done before in money management. They said, one, we want you to commit a certain amount of money we don't actually have any things to invest in yet, commit to it. Two, we would like you to pay us a fee on the committed capital, okay, even though we're not doing anything to invest in your money, you're still holding on to it. And three, we want 20% of the profits, the so-called carried interest. And that revolutionized money management, and that was the, event, the adventure capital business became the venture capital business ultimately. And then around the late 60s, early 70s, some people came up with the idea of what they originally called a bootstrap deal. You would uh, get some money from people, you'd borrow 99% of the purchase price, you put up 1% of the money as equity, and then you'd buy a company at a discount you thought the real value, make it a little bit better, sell it at a profit. So the early adventure capital deals, the early leverage buyout deals called bootstrap deals, earned actually very high returns, not 1% and 2% or 4 and 5%, but 40%, 50%, 60% per annum in many cases. So people started rushing into the industry. So all of a sudden people rushed in, and then 1978 the Carter administration changed the law, of the land that said that ERISA funds could invest under the prudent man rule under, in, in private equity. And therefore, public pension funds and endowments started going into private equity. So the industry grew and grew and grew. Well, when things grow and grow and grow quickly, sometimes you have excesses. So you had your ups and downs and so forth. And around 2006, I thought the industry was growing enormously and people were making lots of money. And I just thought, as Herb Stein, the former head of the Council of Economic Advisors under Nixon said, if something can't keep going on forever, it won't. And so it just was going too well, and I said, at some point, this golden age will be over. And then 2007, 2008, 2009, we had the Great uh, Recession, and things went down. But today, uh, the industry has come back to the point where today there's roughly, I'd say, uh, about $1.5 trillion of dry powder, $2.5 trillion in, in, in the ground investments, so $4 trillion in the industry. The industry is growing still fairly nicely because there's a perception in the world that we're going to have another reception as, a recession at some point, and a very good anti-recession way to invest, people think, is investing in private equity because it tends to not have to get mark to market every hour on the hour. Um, private equity people know how to add value in times of recession, and they tend to buy things cheaply in times of recession. So in the end, uh, people are now increasing their allocation to private equity. So I don't know if I call it a, a post-golden age or platinum age, but industry is in very good shape, and it doesn't have the bad PR that used to have when people call us locusts. It doesn't have people saying we're destroying the economy. It doesn't have people saying we're not paying, uh, we're, well, some people say we're not paying adequate taxes, but it doesn't have people saying we're destroying the environment, we're shipping jobs offshore. So some, many of the criticisms of the industry have, have abated, and I think the industry is generally considered an important part of the financial firmament in the United States and, and Western Europe. Let me ask you about limited partners. Okay. Big investors have been pressing for lower fees. Some are asking for co-investment vehicles. Other investors like Ontario Teachers Pension Plan have built a small group of okay. in-house managers. Given these pressures, where do you see the economic okay. model of private equity going? So the private equity firms, um, there are, when I started Carlisle, there were 250 private equity firms in the entire world. Today, there are roughly 8,000. So it's been a growth industry. Why is that? Well, it's not, again, because of the charm and the good looks of the founders. It's because, in the end, if you can get 20% of the profits on somebody else's money, that is better than practicing law for whatever they get paid an hour. It's just, you're gonna make more money doing that if you're reasonably good at it. And today, uh, many people know how to add value. Many people are, are, are smart who go in the industry. So if you get 20% of the profits, if not 25% or higher on people's money, you're gonna make a lot of money, plus 100% of the profits on your own money. Um, today, I, I'd say that uh, um, the private equity um, you know, world is, is at a point where uh, people, um, think well of the industry, as I mentioned, and they think that this will uh, turn out to be uh, a pretty good way to invest their money, I would say, over a longer period of time. Um, I don't think that uh, it's going to abate anytime soon. Returns are coming down, but investors are willing to take lower rates of return. They used to want 20% net internal rates of return. Today, they're happy with 13 14% net internal rates of return. So I'd, I'd say I think the industry will probably do reasonably well for some time. It's not going to be, uh, you know, 
it, it's, not, it's not as easy to make large sums as it was years ago because the industry is more mature, but I, I do think it's a, a pretty good industry and it has the advantage of, of being a, a reasonably profitable business if you're reasonably good at it. I don't think the fees are going to go down all that much, and this is the reason. Um, I think people recognize to investors that you, you, don't, you get what you pay for in life. So if somebody says, I'll invest private equity money for you, I won't charge a fee, I won't charge a 20% carried interest, I'll just want a 1% fee if the profits are good, you know, you get what you pay for in life. So people would say, if somebody's doing that, they must not be able to get 20% profits, and therefore maybe people don't think they're that good. I think that there was pressure on fees after the Great Recession, and the private equity people may have charged too many fees early on. We were charging deal fees, exit fees, entry fees, uh, lots of management fees, keeping them all ourselves. Now it's changed. Basically, you make your money on your commitment fee, which you know may cover your costs. Or you may have a little bit more than cover your costs. You get 20% of the profits above a preferred return. Uh, today, you probably can't get a, a, a carried interest on a, on a co-investment, but sometimes you can. Now, what you're referring to, the, the Ontario Municipal, uh, Ontario Teachers, is this. Many private equity, many large endowments or national pension funds have said, well, I've looked at Rubenstein and Schwartzman and Kravis and Leon Black. They're all very handsome people, for sure. But, you know, I could probably do some of the things they do. So why don't I just have an in-house group at my organization, and I don't have to pay the 20% to Blackstone, Carlisle, KKR, or Apollo. Um, we can do it ourselves, and we'll pay our people a little bit more than they would otherwise get, but not so much so that, that they're really getting the same compensation that we'd have to pay Carlisle. Some organizations can do that. In some pension funds, in, like in Canada, they're, they're, it's not a terrible thing to let people make millions of dollars a year being a government employee. But in most parts of the world, certainly U.S. public pension funds, you would not be in a situation where an employee of a U.S. public pension fund could make $5 million or $10 million a year without causing enormous political problems. So I think in most parts of the world, it's not possible to retain great talent if you're not paying them large sums of money and very few places in the world are doing that. So I don't think it's an, it's an existential threat to our industry. You also have your own brand of philanthropy. Right. You have given a lot of money to the repairs of the Washington Monument, yes. the Monticello. You have made public available your collections of the Magna Carta, right. the Declaration right. of Independence, the Ten Amendment. Why do you focus on these types of patriotic gifts? Um, well, when you get wealthy, um, what are you going to do with your money? OK, so um, you can. Um, buy a lot of artwork and yachts and planes and so forth. At some point, you realize, you know, um, you, know, you, you, know you don't need all that. So how many houses can you live in? How many works of art can you look at? And so forth. So what, and throughout history, when people got very, very wealthy, they would spend a lot of money buying all these uh, physical uh, material things. Um, and sometimes they would do what the ancient pharaohs did. They'd say, I like all these things I have. I'm going to be buried with it. And so bring it into the pyramids with me, and let me take this to the afterlife. There's no evidence you really need all these material things in the afterlife. So if you think about it, um, if you don't need all these material things in the afterlife, what are you going to do with money? So if I said all, to all of you today, I'll tell you what, you will laugh when I say this. Suppose I'm going to put you in Bill Gates' situation. I'm going to give each of you $100 billion. Do what, anything you want with it. Okay. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to go buy some art, a yacht, plane, houses, whatever you want, and then you've got $99.5 billion left. What are you going to do? 99.5 billion. What are you going to do? You're going to, what are you going to do with that? Well, Bill Gates obviously studied it and decided he wanted to devote his life to health care in, in, in emerging markets and K-12 education in the United States principally. Um, most people who have large sums of money, they do these things. And throughout history, most people who have large sums of money, other than being buried with it like the pharaohs, what do they do? They do nothing with it except they give it to the next generation when they die. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, in my case, I concluded that my children would be burdened by giving them each a billion dollars. Now, they may not agree with that view, but I thought that probably it'd be better to do something else with it. So if you then say you don't want to give all your money to your children, and you don't want to, and you want to, you can say, all right, I'm going to give it to a charity or a philanthropic organization. But most people actually wait to do that until their, uh, their deathbed. In other words, I, I, I'm amazed that so many people give away 99% of their wealth when they die. I say to myself, why not? give it away while you're alive, you can see what's being done with it, unless you're so certain you're going to be in a place where you can see where it's being done. I'm not certain I, I will be in that place. So I concluded that I should try to give away the money while I'm alive. And Bill Gates at that time called me and came to have lunch in my office, and he said, I'm starting a giving pledge. 
give away half your money when you're alive or upon your death, but you can you know, keep half if you want. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna give away all my money. And I just, you know, I got lucky. I'm gonna give it back to the country, made it possible. So I do what most people do. I give an enormous amount of money to educational institutions. I've served probably on more university boards than most people. So I served 12 years on the Duke board. I was the chair of the Duke board, 12 years on the Hopkins board, um, 12 years now on the University of Chicago board, and now I'm on the Harvard Corporation. So I've spent a lot of time giving money to educational institutions, and obviously if you're on these boards, you, they expect you to probably give some money if you're in a position to do so. And I give them a lot of money to medical research, as many people do, who have wealth. But I got lucky in one case. One time I, somebody asked me to go see the Magna Carta. It was on display. I didn't know why it was in New York, not in London. It turned out there are, 12, there are 17 extant copies, one in private hands that was owned by Ross Perot. He was putting it up for sale for whatever reason. I decided that I would buy it to keep it in the country. Of the 17 copies, 15 are in British institutions, one in the Australian Parliament. This was the only copy in private hands, the only one in the United States. And as all of you may know, if you know the history of our country a bit, the, the, the Magna Carta was the inspiration for the Declaration of Independence and for many of the people in our country revolting against England because they said in, the, in our colonial charters, we have the rights of Englishmen and those include the rights of the Magna Carta. So I thought one copy should stay here. So I bought the Magna Carta, I put it on permanent display at the National Archives. So then other people started saying, well, why don't you buy copies of the Emancipation Proclamation, the Declaration of Independence? And I started doing that and put them on display where people could see these copies, maybe be inspired to learn more about the history of it. Then the Washington Monument had earthquake damage. I decided to put up the money to fix it. Then Monticello had problems, uh, Montpelier, um, uh, Mount Vernon. And I started fixing these places. And I ultimately decided that what I was trying to do was remind people of our history because so people, people know so little about our history. We don't teach American history very much anymore. We don't teach civics that much anymore. Uh, today, it's hard to believe, but 10% of Americans who are college graduates think that Judge Judy is on the United States Supreme Court, which is not yet the case. Um, so people know so little about our history. Actually, it turns out three quarters of Americans cannot name the three branches of government. Three quarters of Americans cannot name the three branches of government. So it's a sad situation. So by having these things in American history, um, I uh, kind of do something I call patriotic philanthropy, reminding people of the history and heritage of our country. And I started one program to educate members of Congress about history, where every, every once a month for the last six years, I, I interview a great American historian about American history in front of only members of Congress. It's a dinner I host at the Library of Congress, Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, David McCullough, uh, John Meacham. The book with some of the best interviews is coming out in October. It's called uh, America, The American Story that, I, that I've written. Um, and, uh, one of them was by somebody who was not a historian, but he wanted to be. His name is John Roberts. All of you probably know him. He's a graduate of the Harvard Law School, uh, distinguished graduate, Chief Justice of the United States. I am the chairman of the Smithsonian now, and he's the chancellor, so we work closely together. So I interviewed him in front of members of Congress, because members of Congress don't really know the Chief Justice that well. And so I said to him, well, this is about history generally, and, uh, but we can talk about the law. And, I, I, and he said, fine. I said, by the way, did you always want to be a judge? And he said, well, I had no interest in being a judge. Oh, did you always want to be a lawyer? No, I had no interest in being a lawyer. Did you always want to go to Harvard Law School? I had no interest in going to Harvard Law School. So what did you want to do? He said, I wanted to be a historian. I cared about history more than anything else. I thought it was a great way I could spend time in the library. I loved history, okay, and write books about it. And my father said, John Roberts told me in this interview, that um, you won't make any money as a historian. It's very boring and nobody's gonna read your books, and you sure you can you know, support a family as a historian. John Roberts said, well, I don't really know, I'm not sure, but I really want to be a historian. Okay, his father said, all right, do what you want. Goes to Harvard College, and he majors in history. At the end of his sophomore year, he's coming back from Indiana, summer break, or spring break, he gets off at Logan Airport, off the plane, um, gets in a taxi, and says to the taxi driver, take me to Harvard. He said, oh, are you a student there? Yes, I am. What are you studying there? I'm studying history. Taxi driver said, well, that's what I studied at Harvard as well, history. And John Roberts said, well, geez, maybe, maybe this is not the right profession for me. So he ultimately went to Harvard Law School. But anyway, okay. So I, I, came in, I came up with the concept of patriotic philanthropy to kind of just say I wanted to give back to the country and I'm trying to remind people America, about our history and you know, the theory that if they learn more about history, we won't make some of the mistakes we've made already. Great, so before I ask my last question, yes. I wanna give a heads up to the students that will open up the floor for questions pretty soon. And there are two microphones on the either side of the aisle and you can come up and ask questions. Okay. So my last question is, what's the next big challenge for you? What's next for you? 
Well, I'm 69 years old, so when you get to be 69, the biggest challenge is staying alive. <laughs> um, my law school classmates are generally being retired from these law firms, generally retire you by a certain age now, so you're, none of you are thinking about this, but generally law firms kind of say by 65 or something like that, you have to retire. Accounting firms retire you at 60. So um, my theory is that when people retire you and you don't have anything to do, your brain can atrophy, your body can atrophy, and I notice a lot of people retire early, they drop dead. So I'm just kind of keep going, as, and I'm trying to keep as active and get as many things done before my brain collapses or my body collapses. So none of you are worried about this, you're all young, but I'm trying to get as much done. So I call what I'm doing, I'm writing an autobiography now, it's called Sprinting to the Finish Line. I'm trying to get as much done before uh, it's over. So as you uh, was pointed out in the introduction, I, I now spend half my time at Carlisle. I have a family office in New York where I invest things outside of Carlisle, um, and a you know, good sized team doing that in venture growth capital things. And then I, I chair the Kennedy Center, which the performing arts area at, at center in Washington. And I chair the Smithsonian, and I chair the Council of Foreign Relations, and uh, you know, the Economic Club of Washington. And I have a TV show where I interview prominent people. Some of you may have seen it. It's called The Immodestly Named David Rubenstein Show. It's on uh, Bloomberg TV. I told them, don't name it after me. It's not a good thing to have a name called the David Rubenstein Show. A long ethnic Jewish name was not going to work. And Mike Bloomberg said, no, I don't think that's right. I think it'll work. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, I do that. And then I, I have a lot of other programs where I'm trying to promote history. And I, I, you know, I'm very involved in a lot of philanthropic efforts and, and I serve on a number of boards. And so I've got a couple books coming out. And so I'm trying to keep busy. And my next biggest challenge, I guess, is just staying healthy to, to get this, um, you know, get all these things done before basically it's too late. Great, thank you. And with that, we'd like to open up the floor for some audience all right. questions. questions. If you could please come up. There's you have a mic or who, here's side. a question. <laughs> Hi, thank you. You mentioned that at least the beginning of your career at Carlisle, you uh, were responsible for fundraising while some of your MBA friends were responsible for the finance aspects of the business. I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit more about that. Uh, when you're out there fundraising for a fund, aren't investors asking you specific questions about the fund okay. strategies and things like that? Okay. Um, in the early days of fundraising, I could go out and say, this is our track record, um, and I would talk to them about the firm and so forth. Today, because people are so uh, intent on due diligence, they will say, okay, we've heard your story, Mr. Rubenstein. Great, we like you, we know you. Bring in the people who are actually running the fund. So you have to do that, but if I took all the people or my su successors who are doing fundraising, if I took or they took the people running the funds to every single meeting, the people wouldn't have any time to run the fund. So you basically try to narrow it down to figure out who's interested in having a serious discussion, and then you can trot out the, the actual deal team. So um, a fundraiser today, you know, I, I can go to some people who've been investing with me for 30 years, and I say, this is a great fund, I'm putting a lot of my own money into it. They would say, okay, I, I trust you. But that's true of individual investors, family offices to some extent, but if you have large institutional investors that have fiduciary responsibilities to large numbers of people, they always need to have a gatekeeper, consultant, and they need to do a lot more due diligence. But, but what you say is generally right in the sense that you need to have the deal teams actually in front of the uh, people who have the money. Thank you. Okay? And we'll alternate and take questions from this side. Thank you. On a personal note, making a lot of money has admittedly lost some of it, its attraction to us as a generation who grew up um, a lot more with a lot more like advantages than maybe our parents did. So what are the implications that you see for high commitment jobs sorry, like in... What, the question is what? What are the implications that you see for high commitment jobs like in private equity? And secondly, what is your advice for us as a generation to prioritize the many opportunities that we uh, I, have? Okay. What was, I, like, what was the question? So our generation is less interested in yes. making money than perhaps right. our okay. parents' generations. Right. Given this, what would you think is the attraction of some jobs like private equity where people are making okay. a lot of money? Well, um, you know, every generation, you know, is somewhat different. And generally, younger people are probably not as focused on the making of money as saving the world and other kinds of 
things that would be nice. Generally, though, we find that people, if they get married, they have families, they have children, they tend to focus on the same things that previous you know, generations have done. So at the early ages, uh, when you don't have maybe as many responsibilities, you can focus on ESG-related concerns or environmental concerns, and there's nothing wrong with that, and we, we worry about that as well. Um, I, I don't think that people necessarily have to go make money to be happy. There's no evidence that the happiest people in the world are the wealthiest people. It's maybe the opposite. They're some of the most miserable people in the world are the wealthiest people I know. So um, they just not doesn't necessarily buy you wealth. But I, I do think that if you um, make money, you can do things with it that can make the world a slightly better place in, through philanthropy and so forth. But you know, there's no evidence that that the people that don't have money aren't able to uh, also have a favorable impact in the world. Many people have done great things with having no money. Ralph Nader, um, you know, done a lot of things having no, no money. Uh, a lot of people can be social activists or do great things without mo money. I'm not telling people that this is the only thing they should do, but it does have the advantage that you, you can be well compensated as you can in being a tech startup that's successful, and then you have the freedom to do what you want. And freedom is, you know, is, is a wonderful thing if you can not have to worry about money every day. Thank you so much for being here, Mr. Rubenstein, and thank you for everything you're doing for Duke and for the world. Um, I was hoping to learn more about declaration capital and the strategy you mentioned, venture, you mentioned growth. I'm also very curious about especially this idea of taking capital from outside sources and how limited partners of Carlisle might view such efforts. Who asked you to ask that question? No, I'm just <laughs> right, that's a tricky, complicated situation. Um, let me explain. Um, I, I didn't have a, a uh, family office. Uh, many of my peers who started private equity firms made a lot of money, and ultimately they decided that they wanted to diversify, not put all their money in their Carlisle fund, in their Apollo funds or KKR funds or Blackstone funds, whatever it might be. I didn't do that, and but then eventually people kept saying, "How come you don't have a family office?" So I got what I call family office envy. I, I, had, I, I everybody had a family office but me, so I said, oh, I'm gonna start a family office so people won't be able to ask me if I have a family office anymore, and I say no. So I started one, and um, I, I'm looking at things, this is my money, um, I committed a large amount of it, my money to it, it's, it's deals that Carlisle wouldn't do. Every deal has to be approved by Carlisle, not a conflict and so forth, but Carlisle's not gonna do some venture deals or some seed capital deals or some growth capital deals in certain industries, so I've been putting money into it. Um, if I went out and raised money to supplement what I have, I'd have to get it approved by Carlisle, and it presumably would have to be investors that are not Carlisle investors, or something like that. But there are a lot of families that don't want to invest in large private equity firms, but will invest alongside another family office. So I haven't had to address that directly, but um, the limited partners who invest with Carlisle, they, they, wouldn't, they don't have any problem with my investing some money outside of Carlisle, because everybody understands the, the diversification principle. So people, at Carla, uh, people who invest with Carlisle, they're not going to be upset that, that I'm investing some money in things that Carlisle doesn't do. That hasn't been a big issue. It may be a bigger issue if I go out and raise money for my family office and I have to really be careful I'm not competing with Carlisle for deals or for investors. Hey, uh, thanks a lot, Bobby, for sharing your experience with us. Uh, I had two quick questions. Uh, one is I uh, wanted to get your thoughts on uh, how, do you see, how do you see technology uh, impacting the private equity industry and the broader uh, investment industry in general. And the second question is, given your unique perspective across business and political backgrounds, uh, what's your take on the China-U.S. relationship going forward for the next decade the or two? China-U.S.A. relationship? relationship yeah. Okay. Sorry. On well, technology, um, historically in the buyout world, people laughed at the idea that you could do a technology buyout because people say technology changes so quickly. So if you're holding something for five years, the technology could be obsolete. And so you're stuck with a, uh, an obsolete company. So for many years, uh, the general wisdom, conventional wisdom was technology buyouts don't work. Then a firm named Silver Lake um, got started and they did a couple technology deals that did extremely well. And people said, well, maybe that's not so true. Maybe you can, if you know what you're doing, buy some, do some technology buyouts and they can work if you know what you're doing. And then other people began to notice and say, well, if Silver Lake can do it, we can do it. And so now you see enormous number of buyout deals being done at in, in technology. In fact, Carlisle probably has in one year, I think maybe last year, maybe 50% of our deals were technology related kind of buyouts. Um, and, and, and so I think buyouts um, are increasingly done in the technology industry. And there are three aspects of technology. One is, can technology help you analyze a deal better than another deal? 
uh, uh, artificial intelligence hasn't yet come full circle so that it can really help people analyze whether a company is going to be a good deal to buy, out, buy or not, but at some point it probably will. Secondly, the companies we buy, increasingly we make them more efficient by giving them better technology and better access to better technology, and then the companies we buy may themselves be technology companies. So technology is, is uh, increasingly important, and as one of my partners said recently, every deal today is a technology deal, every deal. Um, in terms of the U.S.-China relationship, um, it's the most important bilateral relationship in the world. I, I, Carlisle is a gigantic investor in China. We, I go there four or five, six times a year. We've got a large percentage of our workforce doing deals in China. It's the best, best place in the world to invest other than the United States, in my view. Um, the U.S.-China relationship has, uh, as all of you probably know, Graham Allison has written a book called uh, The Thucydides uh, Trap, where he basically says that rising powers like China ultimately go to war with, in most cases, with, with the, the presiding power. I don't think that will happen in this case, but I, there's no doubt that China and the United States have the same relationship the two most important economic powers have for every generation, which is they, they're going to clash with each other. President Trump has brought this to the head by trying to negotiate a, a deal on, on, on trade and tariffs and, and other technology-related things. I think he will get a deal done. It's not going to solve all the problems. The enforcement's going to be complicated. But I, I do think the U.S.-China relationship will always be complicated as long as you have the two most powerful economies in the world, because um, they're all competing for you know, uh, customers and, and, and other advantages. Um, I, I think that the trade deal with China will get announced sometime soon to be my guess, as the President has said, and I suspect it will be reasonably well received by the markets, but it won't be perfect. Okay. I want to be Thanks, mindful David. of Mr. Rubenstein's right. schedule, so we have time for one last question. One more question. question. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, quick question. So for the lawyers in the room, um, what is your advice as to how uh, we should approach our legal careers in the law firms? And especially, uh, what, should we, what skills should we cultivate in the law firms to, be, to become helpful and effective PE fund advisors? Well, people call me all the time who are lawyers and say, how do I get out of the legal world and go into the private equity world? <laughs> um, you know, if, you're, if you love the legal world and you like it and you like what lawyers do, and you're good at it, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a lawyer. I think it's a very good profession. There's no, there's no doubt, unless you're a, a plaintiff's lawyer and you're one of the most successful plaintiff's lawyers in the country, you're not going to make the kind of money you can if you're a very successful private equity person. But money doesn't mean everything. It's not necessarily a sign of success. Um, I think people who want to get out of the legal world and get in the private equity world, I tell them, practice law for a few years. Get, you know, corporate law probably helps more than litigation. Practice for a while. Take, use your law degree. My son is a JD MBA candidate at, uh, at Stanford, and you know, he doesn't intend to practice law. He wants to go into a er different area of business. Uh, but I think a law degree is very helpful to him, as I, I told him for a long time. I think uh, you know, if you practice law, you'll inevitably make contacts that will lead to you know, maybe somebody making you an offer to go work in a private equity firm. It's jumping, it, the transition's not easy, but it's easier done, more easily done when you're younger. Um, the skills that are useful, the same skills that I think are useful all throughout professional life. Number one, um, hard work. Number two, perseverance, not taking no for an answer. Number three, learning how to write well, learning how to communicate orally well, learning how to lead by example or being an effective leader, being ethical, uh, learning how to get along with people and share the credit, uh, learning how to be humble and have some humility and not arrogance. Um, and also, I guess, learning how to um, use the money that you're going to make and have a reasonable purpose for the money you're going to make and do something useful with it and have, you know, reasonably good uh, outside interest in a balanced life. But I think as a young lawyer, I would just say learn the skill set and learn how to write well, learn how to get along with people, learn how to share the credit, and ultimately, um, you know, something probably good will happen. Well, with that, thank you, thank you so you much, much, Mr. Rubinstein. This has been extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you much.